here's the ventral cavity, this one that's in the anterior, right? So this part right here, and there is a dorsal cavity that your book doesn't have, or actually the open stacks may have it. So the back over here, it has like the brain and the spinal cord, that's the dorsal cavity. But remember ventral in humans is the same thing as anterior. So the ventral cavity contains all the anterior parts right here. Now there are two main subdivisions. The subdivisions are the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity. And the bit, the, the two are separated by a flat sheet of muscle. Well, actually, it's more rounded, but it's a sheet of muscle called the diaphragm. So between the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity, these are two separate things. And it has a hard border between them called the diaphragm. Now within this, you also have subcavities and smaller cavities within these each of these cavities. So you have a pleural cavity, which encompasses the lungs. It's kind of hard to see, get a knowledge, get a grasp of it from this sagittal view right here, but it contains the lungs and you also have the pericardial cavity. So peri, P-E-R-I, that's a prefix that typically means around or surrounding. And cardia refers to the heart. So this is a cavity that surrounds the heart. And then you have the abdominal cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity. Now notice that they're unlike the division, the diaphragm dividing the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity, there is no hard border between the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity, but there is an indentation. So you, it is contained with a within a structure we call the pelvic girdle. That's where we have our pelvic cavity. So things like your if your urinary bladder or if you're a woman, your uterus, that's where it is. Is it next coming Monday? Oh, sorry, my, my mistake. The holiday is next Monday, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm wishing it was like, so we don't have a quiz on Monday, so. Oh, yes. Let's see. Sorry, I was looking at last year's calendar. Yes, you're correct. Um, we do have lecture on Monday. <laughs> Wishful thinking, okay. Sorry, it's been a long week. So yes, next, next Monday. Next, next Monday. Sorry, it's been a really, really long week. So let's talk about cavities again. So back to spaces. Yeah, burst my dreams, huh? But anyway, so okay, back to cavities. So again, one of the common misconceptions with cavities is that you start thinking about, okay, are they mutually exclusive? No. You can still have cavities within cavities within cavities. So say you're in the UH dorms, right? So you're in the dorms, but you're also located within Honolulu, right? Or Manoa, which is part of the general Honolulu County. And then you're also in the Hawaiian Islands. So if you're in this space, are you, if you're in the UH dorms, not the same thing as the Honolulu, the greater Honolulu area, but you're still within multiple locations. Say you have the pericardial cavity, that's part of the thoracic cavity. And that's also part of the ventral cavity. So remember the heart is part, contained within the pericardial cavity. So the pericardial cavity is also, the heart is located one, within the pericardial cavity. It's also located in the thoracic cavity. And it's also located within the ventral cavity. So they're not mutually exclusive. So you can't have an organ or body part located in multiple cavities at once. But again, these refer just like UH Dorm, Honolulu, and Hawaiian Islands refer to specific places. They can overlap. Same with cavities. Do not think they're like different cavities are. It's either one or the other. You can't have cavities within cavities. So again, cavities, you might think of them just as empty spaces and just rooms, but these are, instead of just being something that's empty, think of them as more like locations and spaces rather than just something that's empty. All right, so let's talk a little about physiology. So we've talked about anatomical terms and landmarks and where things are. Let's talk about uh, basics of how things work. So one crucial concept, so again, this is kind of like tough to get at first, but homeostasis, and what is she doing here? Well, she's doing yoga, but she's also balancing. And that's pretty much what homeostasis can be approximated to. It's some sort of, your body tries to maintain normal conditions and its environment, 
So homeostasis is how your body tries to maintain itself, how it tries to maintain its internal environment so that your cells, your tissues, your organs, and your overall body is functioning optimally and healthily. So this keeps a condition optimal. Why? Because you're made of all these moving parts and living parts and cells. So not only the cells, but also these proteins within the cells, these enzymes that also function to help carry out chemical processes. So the thing is that your body can function in extreme conditions. Like if you can go, you can probably like travel to somewhere cold or somewhere hot, or if your room gets very hot or if your room gets very cold, you can still study and do your daily duties. But are you functioning as efficiently as you would at a comfortable temperature? Probably less so. So same with your cells and enzymes. They do have a range in which they can function, but at, when they go past the comfortable range, that's when they start to lose their function and start having trouble performing what they're supposed to do. So this allows your body to adapt to changes. So the thing is like homeostasis and set points. So set points are like a value or somewhere a state where your body likes to return to. But often there's a normal range. It's not just one single number that you have to return to. There are some things like in my pack back question where there is a very narrow range, but your body does have a certain range that can function normally within. And again, homeostasis. So this is an essential part. So another mnemonic that another professor uses is home state. So it's a comfortable state where you're at home, you're very satisfied and you're all comfortable in that state and functioning optimally. Now, this comes to a concept called negative feedback. So negative feedback isn't like slamming someone online and them criticizing them. Negative feedback, when we talk about it in physiology, this is very important for homeostasis. So it allows changes, but it keeps it in check. So what do I mean by that? Well, what you have with negative feedback, you have A causing B, but B prevents or inhibits A. So you have something causing some A causing B, but B inhibits A. I know it's very, so I like to use this. This is, I think, online. It's called a useless box. So as you can see, this person is disturbing the box. It's turning on a switch. It's turn, causing a change in the box, but the box extends out a little arm that turns itself off. So by turning on the switch, he activates all these motors and gears inside, but that causes changes that eventually shuts itself back off. So this is a negative feedback loop. You disturb the initial state, and that causes changes that reverts it back to its original state. So neg negative feedback is a, was an underlying concept in, as you found in so many countless examples in your body. So if you have a change that goes beyond that normal range or starts to move away from that normal range, typically your body has ways of compensating and bringing your body back away from that change and back to that normal homeostatic range. Okay, so negative feedback and homeostasis. So this is, okay, if you don't know who this is, ask your mom and dad. I tried to, but here's Britney Spears and she's working on stage. So she's doing all this movement, she's dancing, doing her concert or before the whole lockdown thing in Las Vegas. But what happens after? She does all of this and then she's going to end up all sweaty. So why do we sweat when we do high physical activity and exercise? Well, what is happening to her body temperature as she's doing her dance routine than doing that concert? It's going up. So when our body temperature goes up, our natural response is to sweat. But what happens with sweat? When we sweat, well, we're kind of cooling ourselves off. And why is that? Water absorbs heat. So as water, as we sweat, we have all this water on the surface of our body and the surface of our body is absorbing all the heat. So what's that going to do to our overall body temperature? That's going to bring it back down. So she's happy because she's no longer sweating. Yeah, I mean, I could use, I tried to look for a picture of like Cardi B, but she's like always well done. And she's always, I've never seen a picture of her sweaty. But I love this picture of Britney Spears. That's why I use this example. All right, but again, what happens? If she goes, does her concert the next night, then she's going to, the whole cycle repeats. Body temperature goes up. She sweats. All that moisture on the surface of her body helps to cool her off and bring her back down. Now, let's talk about, so this is one of the first things in your book. So levels of st structural organization. So here we have atoms. So every single one of us, we are made out of atoms. We're made out of chemicals. 
But as you can see, atoms can be made into bigger molecules. Molecules are, our cells are made out of molecules, and our tissues are made out of cells. So as you can see, from atoms, you keep on building, building, building into bigger and bigger structures until you finally have an entire human body. So just like how when you build a building, you have things like the sand that makes up concrete, concrete that makes up bricks and the foundation, and then you build up all those bricks and foundations to finally make a building. So atoms are the building blocks of our body. So why does this matter? Well, this is the Pearson version. So again, we're all made of atoms. And here we have chemical levels. So again, atoms make up chemicals. Chemicals make up cells. Cells make up tissues. Cell tissues make up organs. And then you finally have the human body. Now, why is it important to know this hierarchy? Well, one, the, otherwise you wouldn't know which is bigger or smaller. I mean, so a lot of confusion some of you might not know much about tissues and cells yet. So some people are like, are tissues, cells, and chemicals the same, or a water molecule the same size? No, they're vastly different, orders of magnitude and difference in size. So why does this matter? So why do we, is this something just to memorize? Well, the thing is that here we have Alzheimer's disease, and one of the underlying cause, or many underlying causes of Alzheimer's disease is something called amyloid peptides, or beta amyloid peptides. Peptides are small fragments of proteins. So what we have here is that just the small chemical, the small peptide is causing problems with neurons, which are cells, and can cause problems with tissues, can cause problems with the organs. So in terms of Alzheimer's disease, beta amyloid is causing problems with neurons, causing problems with the brain, causing all that psychological and physiological problems that happen with some with Alzheimer's disease. So this is why it's important to know these levels of organizations. Something that goes wrong at the chemical, protein, or cellular level can affect the tissue, can affect the organ, can affect the entire body. So that's why you need to know these levels. All right, so what are, so remember, we're all made out of atoms. So we're 